I have to say that this is my dream panel. <laughs> People whose practices have inspired me for a very long time. So thank you for being here. You can see both Stephanie and Ioanni's work in the focus section. Diani, I am just such a super fan of that, I'm, that I invited Diani to be here because you can often see her work everywhere, but also because many in the city really saw it as part of the last Whitney Biennial, encountered it there. Um, and I think that resonances are still felt in this, in this city, in Manhattan. I wanted to begin by thinking through this word inheritance, and I think we're going to think through it together as well. So I've been thinking of inheritance and inheritances. I've been thinking of inheritance as material. I've been thinking of it as fabricated, as tethered, as stitched, as quilled, as beaded. I've been thinking of inheritance as kin, and that can be your chosen family and not. I've been thinking of inheritance as a form of claiming potential histories and also the things that claim you. Colonialism is an inheritance and it's an inheritance for us here sitting on this panel now. But our inheritance is also its resistance. Institutions are inheritances particularly those that are heavy laden with storage. And those are some of the things that we're, we'll be thinking through, as well as how archives are particular forms of inheritances and ones that we have to claim because in, very, in many cases, they are not fully formed. They're highly personal, they're oral, they're also fabricated, they can be filled with holes, they're politicized. They're documented and non. So we do have a special guest on this panel. His name is G. Peter Jemison. Pete's work you can see also in the focus section of, of the armory. And it is, in a way, a mini survey of his practice. It starts in the 1960s. So they have work on view from every decade. Pete really wanted to be with us tonight, or today. And he had an opening that he had to fly to, but he was here for the last few days of the fair. And the reason that I also wanted to bring him in dialogue here is because he started working in New York in the 1960s with Lloyd Oxendine Gallery. And to also show that in New York, there is a long history of Native practice, of course, and Native engagement with contemporary art. So we're going to begin with a brief five-minute video from Pete so he can be in dialogue with all of us because his spirit is here right now. Peter Jemison. I'm a member of the Seneca Nation of Indians. I come from a community called Cataraugus. I grew up in a border town called Irving on the northern end of the Cataraugus territory. My real interest in art really be began about junior high school and in senior high. And I think I thought to myself, it was something I could be good at. But when I was in the art room and you know, working by myself at projects that I had been given, I, was, I got a lot of satisfaction out of it. So when I went to art school, a whole different way of thinking was exposed to me, and that was the possibility of becoming an artist and, um, and the art world. you know. What, what did that mean? In the school that I went to, we were taught fundamentals. We were taught how to paint with different mediums, whether we were learning to paint with oil or we were learning to paint maybe even with egg tempera or we were learning to paint with uh, gouache. You know, we were taught how to do it. We were taught how to work with um, materials in sculpture. So all of these things, the fundamentals of art, we were given instruction. Well, then I started thinking, you know, I'm going to graduate, and people were talking about going to graduate school. What graduate school were they going to go to? And maybe Yale would be the place that I would want to go. And I had a friend, and he thought the same way. 
that Yale would be ideal for him. So the two of us applied for Yale. We really knew need, that not both of us were going to get in. One of us was and one of us was not going to get in probably. Um, and I was the one who didn't get into Yale. So when that happened, I thought to myself, well, what, what I do uh, as a second choice? And I couldn't think of another school that I really wanted to go to for graduate work. So I thought to myself, um, I'll move to New York City. I had already been spending a lot of time in New York City. Every vacation, I found a way to go to New York and just walk through museums, art galleries, anything that was free where art was on exhibit. I went there and I spent time there. So I was well aware of what New York was like. And I, for whatever reason, had basically no fear of moving to New York. So in, in, so in 1978, um, I make my mind up, I'm going to move to New York City. I'm going to take this job as the first real curator for the American Indian Community House Gallery and find an apartment and eventually bring my family to New York and uh, restart my art career in New York City again, you know. Uh, this is 1978, it's the summer. I literally get on a bus, take a bus to New York with a suitcase on a Greyhound bus from Salamanca to, to uh, New York City, you know. And, you know, I kind of going to start a whole new career. And at that time, the community house is located at uh, Fifth Avenue and 38th Street between uh, Fifth and Madison. And uh, it's kind of in an area where there really aren't other art galleries, but the community house had a ground floor showroom that they had converted into a nice space. While I was living there, two friends of mine became curators at the Museum of the American Indian. As a result of that, of course, I get to know who Lloyd Oxendine is, and I also learn about these other artists who previously I had really no contact with. And... Um, Lloyd informs me that he's going to open a gallery in Soho, and it's uh, when Soho is just kind of beginning, really, as an art center. There are a few galleries there, but it's still in the early days. There was really nothing big happening in New York except the Community House Gallery that was just beginning to get itself off the ground. Um, you know, you, you still had like anthropologists interested in Native Americans. Uh, but you didn't have the art world really interested in Native Americans. Yet the, the Institute of American Indian Arts had now been existing since the late 60s, you know. So it... That's a very brief history of Pete's engagement with the scene here in New York. Um, but part of the reason that I wanted to bring him in dialogue is to just show, you know, one of the fears, I think, of being in this context is that somehow it seems like indigenous art broadly, that other histories, Stephanie, that you're going to speak about are somehow just sort of rising to the surface or just surfacing, but it's not true. We're deeply embedded in these grounds, right? Um, and what I've asked each of you to do is to speak uh, about your work briefly, um, to speak about why you do what you do, how you do what you do, how you think about um, you know, the various things that you've inherited through your practice. And also particularly how, uh, for many of you, you all engage in archives in different ways and you probably all define archives in particular ways. So I was wondering, uh, Diani, if we can begin with you, because I know that Pete's someone who's had an influence on your practice too, um, but if you could share more about your work. Um, hello? Oh. Was on the whole time? There we go. Hopefully you all weren't listening to Russell's in my lap, but um, hello everybody. Ahamatak yapi, wambli weyaka, washtewi, imach yapi, washi chumie, Diani, Whitehawk, Polk. Um, thank you, Candice, for inviting me. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I'm really grateful to be able to participate in the panel um, and 
be able to see what's happening here this year, which is unique and a first of its kind, and I'm grateful for the work that you're doing. So I want to I start there because now I just want to talk about everything Pete said. <laughs> I'll talk about my work, but what we're talking about our work, I guess, really in response to what he's talking about. So we got a brief history of, of Pete's history, but it's so much about the greater conversation, right? So I'm an IAIA graduate, Institute of American Indian Arts graduate. I graduated from that school in uh, 2008 with my bachelor's degree. Um, I'm watching him speak and thinking about uh, the legacies that artists like, like himself and others that we studied at the Institute of American Indian Arts um, laid for us. So I'm a, a painter and mixed media artist, a multimedia artist. My studio practice is founded predominantly in painting and beadwork. And I draw from the lineage of Lakota abstraction and easel painting abstraction. Do you want to speak what Lakota abstraction is? Yeah, I do. I also want to... Um, so when I speak about Lakota abstraction, and the reason I'm using these two distinctions, I draw from the lineages of Lakota abstraction and easel painting abstraction, is because one of the flaws that I see in the field is the word abstraction is used, or the word modern is used, or the in these like, and and then we're supposed to all assume that that means European and European American abstraction, but that's one practice in a human practice of utilizing abstraction. It's a human expression and it's a global expression and it comes in many forms. So easel painting abstraction is one form of the use of abstraction and Lakota abstraction that I draw from is rooted in what has historically been women's practices in uh, porcupine quill work, in parfletch painting, in beadwork, and in other forms of utilizing abstraction to speak about our worldviews, our cosmologies, personal histories, tribal histories, etc. So this is an ex the uh, piece that's up now is an example of the ways that I utilize those lineages that I'm uh, born to, these practices of, of beadwork, um, in my contemporary art practice. And I came to utilize these forms in my contemporary art practice first and foremost because I learned them outside of the contemporary art field first. So I learned how to do beadwork as a teenager and in preparation for learning how to make regalia, you know, in preparation for learning how to you know, make our clothing that we utilize in cultural practices and in, in, in dance and in ceremony and um, adorning your relatives and, and whatever that may be. Um, and I learned that before I learned painting. And then I went to two tribal colleges. And when I was at two, I went to Haskell Indian Nations University first, and then IAIA. And in those spaces, I learned US history and global history from an indigenous perspective. And then I also learned art history from an indigenous perspective. And I had the opportunity to not only paint in a painting studio, but I also had the opportunity to take traditional arts courses where I was able to continue to uh, refine the practices of beadwork and quill work and parfletch painting, and then went to grad school and had to figure out how to marry all of those things, how to figure out how to make like mainstream academia uh, speak to and be in coordination with these practices that I had learned and had been developing since I was a teenager, um, specific to uh, the artistic lineage of my tribe and of my community. Diani, um, I just, you reminded me of one quote uh, by Kay Walkingstick, uh, also a great painter. And she said that abstraction is the tradition of Native women. And she also said that the oldest history of, of abstraction on this land has been practiced by Native women. And I think that your work definitely carries that forward. And before uh, we move to Yanni, I just wanted to provide a little bit of context for Institute of American Indian Arts, which is a really exceptional place. And it started in 1963, and first as a boarding school, it was a high school program, 
they were deeply engaged with um, experimental practices from their very inception. Lloyd Kiva knew the first um, president of the Institute of American Indian Arts moved from Scottsdale and he was a fashion designer. And he commissioned Paolo Soleri to design their first amphitheater for New Native Theater and because he was the most experimental architect at the moment. Um, so I'd say that this, this tradition of innovation is certainly you know, what comes forward in your work, but also a deep critique of the ways in which uh, modern abstract painters and also those who we associate with minimalism like Donald Judd we're, we're mining the cultural aesthetics of native people. So that's also a kind of art inheritance that hasn't really been um, taken apart yet, but I think your work starts to do that and it does it very effectively. Thank you. And Yanni. Thank you. Um, it's just a pleasure to be here. So um, thanks for everyone for coming. Um, my name is Yuani Skes. I'm a Gugutha Nukunu woman from South Australia. As mentioned previously, I was, I'm born in Woomera, which is um, uh, still a current uh, or currently active um, military zone, testing zone, and it's uh, five hours north of Adelaide in South Australia, and it's um, the, I guess, it crosses um, the uh, majority of South Australia and is actually the same size as the United Kingdom. Um, to put it in perspective. So it covers a lot of my Gugutha country and, um, and uh, it still, it very much um, drives my, my practice. So I went to art school as a mature age student, um, 28, and uh, graduated um, uh, from the University of South Australia with a major in glass blowing. So I'm trained as a glass blower, um, but after during my honours year, um, I was looking more and more into using found objects and the family archive and the archives in general. And um, so um, over the course of my um, artistic practice, I think I've um, delved into uh, not just family history, but uh, the history of nuclear colonisation in South Australia which happened by the, with, by the British and Australian governments in the 1950s through the early 1960s and um, still, um, still is yet to be, um, I guess, fully acknowledged there. So uh, I have made a, a, a number of uh, works related to the fallout clouds and the effect of um, nuclear uh, uh, colonisation on... Uh, our people in South Australia. So there's, uh, I travel quite a lot internationally looking at archival material. And last year I was in, the uni uh, in Birmingham uh, as part of a residency program with Icon Gallery, looking at the University of Birmingham's archive, University of Oxford, Cambridge University as well, because um, a lot of their archival material is still classified, but they're, they're slowly releasing it, but the University of Birmingham was um, uh, instrumental, I think, in developing uh, the atomic bomb, which was then uh, tested in South Australia. So um, I think uh, a lot of my practice is about truth-telling and um, uncovering that information that has been kept secret for a long time. and. I rely a lot on oral history um, through my family networks and, um, and that's an important part of, um, uh, I guess, my uh, development of, of my, art, my artworks because if you don't get it right, you make an artwork, you, you know, you show it to people publicly, then, you know, they're going to see it. So it's kind of, you know, spend long periods of time talking and it's not just with family, it's about, it's with other community members as well. So, um, but, and more, um, and that's, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's what um, is important to me, is important to my mob back home and, um, I'm very fortunate to be able to share those stories internationally, not just nationally at home in Australia, and, and to meet other uh, First Nations artists and share similar stories of um, how uh, our nations were colonised as well. So, um, 
and the images that you can see here at the moment, they're my, um, my family, my ancestors in South Australia. Um, I work with a printmaking studio in Melbourne uh, with, um, <clears throat> who can produce large scale um, screen prints of um, photographs that I find. And um, this particular work, Remember Royalty, is about uh, how um, my family were colonised and moved on to Christian missions and um, were, uh, I guess, f forced to live in that area where they lost their language, were, you know, died from uh, sickness, but also they were still very uh, s strong and I wouldn't be here without them. And so it's important to share their stories because at that time they didn't have a voice, whereas um, their... their um, their power was passed down to me. So, um, and so the work that you might, you will see here at, in the focus section is the two churches that um, are on those Christian missions where my grandparents were born. They're, they're buried there, um, one at Point Pierce and one at Coonabra. Uh But I wanted to uh, uh, represent the place where a lot of my ancestors uh, were incarcerated had died. Um, the print, as you can see here, um, has been printed in iron oxide and it's to uh, reference dried blood and blood loss in, that, in, in those sediments. And I use bush yams um, to represent the deceased, um, the deceased people from my country. And so the, the boxes that are there are what I call pauper's graves as well, but they're also memorials to, to my, my family, yeah. Mm. Thank you, Yanni. The first work I remember encountering of yours was, I never forgot it. It was the most evocative thing I had seen in a long time. It was a cloud of blown glass. Now I understand they were glass yams and bush yam, as you say, which uh, as you, you and I had been talking over the last couple of, of days, was the food that sustained people and also a signifier of resistance. And these clouds were replicating, you know, the mushroom cloud, the, the, the bomb. And as far as I understand, when the British and the Australian governments were teaming together to do nuclear testing in South Australia, no, no one was warned. So there was a, not just a profound lack of consent, but lack of life and uh, death as a result of this testing, but it also was an acute reminder of which people they valued and which people they didn't, which had a lot of resonances with the area that I was living in at the time, uh, New Mexico, where there's a term there that's called the downwinders, which included ranchers, farmers, but also local native folks. And when uh, uranium was first found at Laguna Pueblo, um, people weren't warned as to the risks of mining it. For them, it was immediately an opportunity for an economy, not realizing you know, what would happen uh, after, after the fact. So when I'm thinking about your work and also Stephanie's work, and we'll, we'll hear from you, in, in a second, Stephanie, I'm thinking about how political it is in terms of what's rendered visible and invisible, mm. particularly in your work, Yoni. Mm. Mm. For sure, I think, like with, particularly with those nuclear tests in, in Australia, but also here, um, uh, you know, as part of the Manhattan Project, I think there's uh, the governments at the time were relying on secrecy and they would threaten um, their own staff, but also. Um, relied on the fact that no one cared about Indigenous people being in the area. And in South Australia, at the time, um, uh, Aboriginal people were not considered citizens of Australia. We, we were under the Flora and Fauna Act, so uh, they were able to get away with um, uh, uh, killing masses. And um, I call it mass genocide because we still, to this moment, don't know how many people died because they were disappearing. And there was one gentleman, um, not gentleman, um, actually a man, 
um, who was employed to remove as many Aboriginal people in the area as fast as possible, but he was given 10 days. And if you look at the scale of the size of South Australia, 10 days is nothing. And there's like Aboriginal people moving around all over the place. And, um, and I think uh, even now with like uh, Oppenheimer being released as a movie, it's sort of, it's so disappointing to see that film being um, about this man that developed this, this bomb, but there's very little at all, if not nothing, mentioned about First Nations people in the area. Well, I think often history, and I don't think Australia is any different, is often filtered through um, the figures of white men, honestly. So with that, maybe Stephanie. <laughs> I'm going to turn the mic. Nice. <laughs> anyway, um, it's a real honor to be here. I appreciate um, speaking towards the archive and also um, how, uh, in many ways, we resist it. You know, we, we bring things forward. We're also talking back to it. Um, as the images are scrolling through, um, the, the images that I'm sharing um, are actually ones in which I was... Uh, embedded in archives. So I, part of my practice is to get access to archives, in some cases, large institutions like the Smithsonian or um, you know, uh, public uh, collections and uh, museums. And uh, my question really when I come into these archives is how does the archive itself construct an identity? And how does it fabricate what we remember about history or people. And so as a Filipino American, um, someone who was born overseas but came to the United States, it really struck me that the, we as Filipinos and Filipino Americans are actually not much in the American imagination, despite a colonial history and having been a part of the United States as a kind of takeover in the uh, late 1800s, up until 1945, which then we gained independence from the United States. <laughs> but um, so when I go into these archives, I'm, I'm, I'm looking to see what is held. And in many cases, it's through a colonial lens. And it's really fascinating as an individual to attempt to learn about myself through this lens. And you know, so some of the images that are coming up are literally images of folders that are open to showcase you know, what is there, what's also kind of reflecting back at you from the glare of the camera. And I, I work very quickly in archives because in many cases I don't, have a, um, I don't have a fancy camera set up and I'm actually not allowed to really create a large intervention in it. It's a very fast research process. So from there though, if you find hundreds and hundreds of problematic images and documents, what do you do with them? And so part of my strategy recently has been to uh, obscure them in some way, whether that's through crumpling, covering, layering, cropping, doing things in which there's a kind of disruption of the original image. And in this case, this is an image of uh, Filipinos who were put on display in the 1904 World's Fair in what were called human zoos at the time. And in this case, this was also interestingly called the Philippine Reservation. So, you know, the, the, the kind of connections, too, between how uh, Filipinos were uh, looked at. Um, this is also a work of mine, uh, thinking about American history, um, but using textiles and handmade craft to talk about how uh, history is essentially fabricated and constructed. So using chroma key green screen fabric, which is a photo, uh, digital photo and video backdrop fabric, I hand sewed uh, three iconic American costumes um, uh, that are based on significant time periods in which we're supposed to see as pivotal to the formation of the country. Um, so, I, I guess in a nutshell, the, what I found about the archives, for me, it's, it's not about my family per se, it's about the lasting legacy of how, um, if we're given the colonial archive as a means in which to describe ourselves, how can we deviate from that? What are the margins and the hidden spots? What are the ways in which um, we can disinherit this legacy. And so thinking through the idea of inheritances, I'd like to think about it in terms of like leaving it behind, disinheriting it, and even claiming for myself a kind of bastard space, 
a bastard identity in this because it, it is not the kind of lineage I would like to be a part of. Right. Stephanie, you and I were talking, uh, speaking yesterday about the kind of heaviness of authenticity and authenticity, in fact, just inherently produces this idea of bastardization, I think, because it's just such a thick projection, right? Um, and I think that that's something that we all, we all work with uh, in our own practices. And Diani, you haven't spoke about the archive yet, but I remember one of the first times we met and you were making these extraordinary paintings just of the vamps, so the tops of moccasins. And you shared a story with me about what you found in one of the toes of the moccasins that you were looking at and how it was also, a sim it was similarly crumpled. But I think the person who crumpled it was doing it for very different reasons. And I wondered if you could share a little bit about that because I think that that then really changed perhaps the way that you were, you were thinking about your engagement with these spaces and also with the way that, you know, many of our things as Native people are held in the archive but held often differently. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's, so I also do a lot of collections research and I think that the, the common thread, I mean, there's gonna be a lot of common threads, <laughs> but one of them is the fact that a lot of our works are, are there in ethnographic, archeological style collections as opposed to um, with all the rest of the art with a capital A. And so that's, that's part of it. And it is problematic and there's challenges. You know, I, I go into collections and um, oftentimes things are, are mislabeled or, you know, it's just, just a region that's uh, noted as opposed to the specificity of a tribe. No names, hardly ever, in relationship to objects because things were collected as, as cultural objects as opposed to uh, artistic expression. Um, but it is a resource for me to connect to the work of my ancestors and I'm, for that part of it, very grateful to be able to have that connection. And so I do a lot of collections research and I, I visit with these objects as, as often as I can. And I spent a week at the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian Archives looking at as much Lakota quill work and beadwork as I could get my eyes and hands on. And one of the objects that I had asked to see was a tobacco bag. And you know they'll get out racks of the things and put them on racks that you've requested. And uh, they, they sit with you for a lot of the time, but then sometimes, especially if you're there for a week, they'll head out for a little while while you're working and come back and check on you later. And it was during one of those moments I was um, looking at this bag, and one of the treats about being in the archives is that you get to look at everything. You know, it's not just in a case. You get to turn it around. You get to open it. You get to look at how it's constructed. Think about the everything of that piece. And with this bag, I looked inside, and I saw something like a square inside of it that I thought was maybe a piece of cardboard to, like for rigidity or something. And I almost didn't pull it out because I thought, you know, it just looked like it was in there on purpose. And then I was like, no, 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 I, I want to see what that is. So I opened it back up and I pulled it out and it was a newspaper yeah. from, I think it was, if I remember correctly, 1892. And, you know, it's folded into this little square, but it's a really big old school newspaper with tiny, tiny fonts. And uh, it was a newspaper documenting the sale of land on my reservation. So it was Indian land sale, Rosebud, and uh, it was, you know, the tiniest print on this huge piece of paper, front and back, all plots of land. And dollar amounts, and last names, and it's a uh, a physical presentation of the history I already know well in relationship to the detrimental effects of the Dawes Act and strategic ways to continue to steal land. You might have to share what the Dawes Act is. Not everyone knows. You all have to do your research when you're done, when we're done here. But the Dawes Act, and this is one of those things, this is the things that were like, US history isn't taught to the full history just isn't taught in public education and it needs to be and that's part of what drives my work is 
How do we create opportunities for us to share our stories so we get to a place where we're just telling the full story? So the Dawes Act was um, a way they took you know, the res it was a continued effort to steal in land. So the reservations were established, and then which was already land theft in and of itself. And then in the Dawes Act, they're like, okay, we're gonna take the reservation and we're gonna split it into parcels and give parcels to individual people and split up the communal aspect of a reservation and make it individual land. And then you have to perform accordingly to keep that land. And if you don't perform accordingly to keep that land in farming, or whatever it was, then we can sell it. But also, after we've given everybody a parcel, whatever is left over, we're going to let homesteaders come in and take. So even within the reservation, it created access for white folks to come in and get land even within reservation borders. So my reservation is checkerboarded. It's what they call as native and non-native people even within reservation boundaries. So it was one C continued strategy to, to eradicate communal lifestyles, tribal lifestyles to individuals and then to impose white values on lifestyles and steal land in accordance to that. Um, so I opened this newspaper and it's Rosebud Indian Land Sale and it's all these plots of land and there's family names on that newspaper and there's like cousins names on that newspaper and names that I've never heard before because they're not here anymore, you know? And I just stood in front of that paper and I was like, it's such a profound experience because one, it's heartbreaking. Like you know the history, but then to have these physical remnants right in front of you to see it, you know? Uh, and then also, like beautifully exciting too because then they came back over and they're like, where did you get that? So it's like, it was in this bag. <laughs> and they're like, what? <laughs> I was like, yeah. And they said, well, it's probably been in that bag since then, yeah. you know? And um, it was a profound experience because you, it's important for us to reconnect to those histories and to be able to have access to those things so that we can share them. Right? And so it feels like a connection to ancestors and it feels like a, a beautiful happening and it's crushing at the same time. Yeah, I think that, um, well, I remember when you shared that with me and I think you had a photo of it that, that you showed me. And it was, I was really struck with how, you know, for many, many of our things, when they enter collections, our ancestral belongings, when they enter collections, or ancestors enter collections, the social history in terms of how those things came to be there is never given that context. And so this was quite literally tucked inside the bag and probably part of the reason that the bag was there as well. Um, so I was really struck by that. And one, uh, one thing that I wanted to, and to turn to you, Yoani, um, I'm curious if you can share more about where your images come from when you, when you work with images and how you engage, you said that, um, you know, a lot of what, what you inherit are, is oral, right? And that's, that's definitely the case. It's definitely the case when you're working with family archives as well. Um, so where do your images come from? How do you generate them? And do you also make them monumental? So I wanted to hear a little bit more about scale. Um, so the images that, uh, yeah, I do have in my possession of, of from, um, other family members that are doing family history research and they are uh, within um, the Lutheran archive, um, I guess, Lutheran archives, I get yeah, in Adelaide, in South Australia and, and the South Australian uh, History Museum, or Family History Museum in Adelaide. So uh, a lot of us share the images, they're digital um, uh, because the problem with those types of um, collections or archives is that the, the particularly the Lutheran um, mission archives is that they keep the original photograph and then they make you pay to have a digital copy. So my, so we, sh yeah, we pay whatever we need um, to get it and then we just, yeah, everyone has a copy. And um, so, but with 
the, and it's the same with the South Australian History, um, Family History um, Museum, is that uh, a lot of the archival material there photographically uh, from the Norman Tyndale collection. And he was, for those who are not aware of him, he's American and he uh, did a lot of ethnographic studies in South Australia, um, in Australia actually, um, a lot of the time in South Australia as well in the 1930s, taking scientific um, elements from uh, samples from uh, Aboriginal people and a lot of them were photographs. And so um, just even gaining those 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 images is um, a problem as well. So you still have to pay for them. Um, you are uh, asked what you're going to do with them. And, uh, and so I, um, again, rely on family again to um, we share as well. And because uh, th the problem um, also is that uh, they still they look at the white law of family, and so my grandfather had um, like uh, six sisters, and so they're my nanas. And so when you look at photographs of them in the the museum archive, if you ask for a copy, they say, "Well, you're not a direct descendant," but they <laughs> they are they are and they're, yeah they're my grandmothers, so it's it's frustrating. So um, yeah. Um, but um, I take a lot of photographs myself yeah. um, and uh, I don't consider myself a photographer, but um, I do like taking photos. So, um, but the, yeah, um, it's becoming my archive now. So, um, and when I go back home, I live in Melbourne, um, but I go, I try to get home as much as possible and and take as many photos as, pos as, as I can, particularly in Woomera, my birthplace, but also at Coonabar and Point Pierce as well. And so the point, uh, the Coonabar church that you see here, I've got hundreds and hundreds of photos of that church. And I, don't, I never understood why, because I don't like it. Um, I don't like either of them. But um, every time I visit the community, I'm always taking photos. And then I found out recently my uh, great 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 grandfather helped build that church. So, um, but and yeah. we were talking about how the churches are still active. They're not, you know, yeah. they're not a monument to when they were, you know, a place of forced assimilation. They actually still are practicing that assimilation Soon in community are. now. Yeah, 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 for sure. So I think I need people to know that they're still there. They're still present. They they're well cared for. It, um, and I find that extremely odd, but um, but again, it's kind of like that that influence of um, Christian missionaries still having that generational influence on my family, where those buildings have prime position in the communities. Yeah. So yeah, um, I was hmm. thinking for for all of what what you do, perhaps another. I know there's many threads that that tie your practices together. Um, I think for many of us, we're deeply engaged with the fact that a lot of our inheritances are held, you know, at a distance from us, right? And um, I've been thinking through, you know, how do you, how do you repatriate, but instead perhaps, you know, enact practices of rematriation uh, with the archive? But uh, uh, something I've been thinking through lately, and I wanted to ask each of you if this resonates or not, is this idea of what we might call repatriation otherwise, because there's so many rules, and in the United States we're governed by um, NAGPRA uh, as Native people in terms of what can come back and in what condition and how. Um, but one of the things that uh, an artist that I've been in dialogue with for quite some time, Tanya Lucan Linklater, has put forward, and I think each of you practice this, is she was saying, well, for her, one of these practices of rematriation, it's not always possible to get your belonging back or to get an image back. But for her, that those, what she calls protocols of visitation are another form, having that, not just visiting, but then you start to embody this closeness, right? And I know, Stephanie, you said that you sometimes only have these fleeting moments there, right? But your body is there. And archives, I think, and, and the way that 
you know, our things are stored is so deeply dehumanizing because what they're trying to do always is one, uh, they're simultaneously, I think, afraid of life. So touch, things like that, bodies, you know, our secretions, insects, but they're also simultaneously afraid of death, <laughs> right? They try to keep them at this like very particular uh, temperature and things like that to sustain them. So I think there's this kind of neuroses with these collections. But uh, Stephanie, I was wondering if you could share, we, we have um, a few minutes left. How have you learned to navigate these spaces and do you have tips that you would share <laughs> with others? Um, because this, this is also your practice about, about how, how, you, how do you do that? Yeah, so I guess on a practical level, I mean, when I get access to these archives, it's usually for a set amount of time. You don't really know what you're looking for because it's literally mounds and mounds of stuff. And so there's this sort of like culling and, you know, sifting. Um, and you, it's hours and hours. And then at night, I go home and I take a shower. <laughs> because, you know, like, because you're just like being inundated with this stuff that you're trying to figure out what to do with. What's also interesting about the archive, and for me, it's mostly photographic archives I'm looking at, those images are not going to be repatriated, right? There's no place to put the photo back somewhere. They're, they're images, they're, they're ways of looking at people. They will always be in the archive. They will always actually hold that kind of visible power. And originally when photography um, became more accessible to middle class consumers, they were widely circulated through postcards and photographs and that kind of thing. So what I'm fascinated with, with this mountain of imagery is thinking about it as material as well. You know, so they're, they're not just images in, say, like a digital sense. They, they're physical. There's also this wonderful term, I think, uh, that applies to material that decays over time, and it's called inherent vice. And so conservators hate this. It's basically, you know, that there's acid in the paper. There's things that, that decay and detach and that, that stuff. And at a certain point, I'm like, why save it? <laughs> you know, like there's, a, um, uh, there's, there's something interesting about it, like receding. Um, even though I understand one could also read that as potential erasure. Um, it's a double-edged sword. Like, why should these images still keep delivering the same thing. And I think it's that interruption to what a natural life cycle is too, right? So again, that like, you know, that fear of death, let's say, <laughs> you know, why keep it? Um, one final thing that I wanted to bring forward is about the materiality of how you make what you make. You know, Stephanie, I'm thinking of your phantom flag you were talking about how hard it was to stitch that silk, right? Um, you were also talking about how sometimes, you know, there's this overlay of narratives of loss and you said very distinctly, you said, actually that piece is about rage. <laughs> that piece is about rage. Um, but it was done in such a delicate way. Diani, I'm thinking about how your work is very literally stitched there's this incredible amount of labor to those stitches. And if you see that piece that keeps cycling through at the Whitney Biennial, those are all, you know, loom beaded. And it took, I believe, more than a year. So, and I feel like this, you know, use of, of the hand and labor and the care that's invested in all of your works and the, you know, the making of glass, the process of that, how you know, why is that kind of labor important to you and also this manifesting of beauty through it as well? Can I just say something? It's about um, the love, yeah, the love for, for us, for our people, for our ancestors. Mm. Mm. I'm a little the opposite. I do all my work uh, through rage. <laughs> And so when I'm making, you know, when I'm crafting these like dresses or flags, I'm really thinking about the white gaze. You know, the work is really about the construction of American identity through the white gaze. Um, so it's a, it's a little on the opposite end for me. And I feel like I'm always striving for balance between both. <laughs> so the, the need to do the super labor intensive processes, those are because I, I must do them. They're connected to our practices. That's a part of my inheritance. I love it. It nurtures me. 
It allows me to create pieces that I work very hard that hopefully they nurture audiences. Um, it is 100% founded in love and lineage. And I work really hard to create beautiful objects because I believe beauty is medicinal. I believe when you stand in front of nature, when you stand in front of uh, artworks that hit you physically first that you respond to and you get filled up, like we all need that, right? And so I want the work to do that. And then I think that if I offer that gift to people and they get filled up, they'll stay longer to listen to the hard conversations or learn about the hard conversations that are within. And so sometimes I find myself on panels, I get to the rage place and I'm like, this is like with the Dawes Act thing, you know? I mean, all of those conversations are embedded in the work, right? So the, with the Dawes Act, with that piece that we were talking about earlier, there's a print that was made from that that's called Trust and Loss that was made through Tamron Institute in uh, Albuquerque. And so it's like processing that, right? The love for your people, the love for the lineage, the love for those like great artistic lineages that we're born to and the beauty that we, that we were a part of, right? And then the rage that comes with the mistreatment and, and, and the, the, um, just the awful history that our communities have endured. And then how do you find balance to go forward that hopefully we're creating pieces that create opportunities for us to have conversations where we're all growing, like we're all growing together. That's the beauty I think about that for me in art is we get to learn about each other's stories. And when we have, we learn each other's stories, we're just uh, better equipped to practice compassion. I'm realizing as well, oh, Yanni, did you want to say something? No, this. <laughs> um, there's something seductive about it, right? There's something seductive about that phantom flag, Stephanie, and I hope you'll speak more about this work because it's also centrally located here. There's something seductive about the surface of your work, Diani, that you know you can't look away, and it pulls you in, and I feel like that is part of its power to talk about these other things. And Yanni, I feel like I've seen so many people look at and be completely enveloped by those images, even if they're not aware initially why the yams are there. And each of the yams really represents an individual, also some of your ancestors, who are like quite literally buried in those grounds. So I, I wanted to see if either of you wanted to speak about that, that idea of how beauty can have an edge and seduction can have an edge, and that can be very productive. Sure, okay, I'll pick up. Yeah, I, the, the craftedness of things, I think, right. Yeah, that's important. So again, it's easy to say crumple a piece of paper or tear something. But then when I have to spend like a year fabricating three traditional American dresses, you know, using like learning bonnet making and, you know, lace um, embroidery, really like these very classic, you know, uh, 19th century techniques. I wanted that commitment. It, I feel like, yeah, when, when we make the work, right, like we, at least for me, I, I, it's important too that the commitment to the idea is shown through. So whether that's like time, labor, effort, or even like new knowledge, you know, gained to make the work. Um, it's, for me in particular though, with those, the, the flag, um, yeah, it, embroidered stars, you know, it's not a printed piece. It's like I use flag. I learned how to use uh, seaming, you know, from uh, flag making, you know, so I, I really go deep into it because, again, I think to reconstruct something, you know, you have to go deep. Yeah, I think with, um, with the, the prints, um, I uh, have all, um, worked with a an amazing printmaker who's, who, who's been um, running his studios for, gee, I don't know how long Stuart's been doing it for, but it's, it's um, I like talking to him about the materiality of, of the image, what's within the image, and then it was an, it's important to work with someone um, who understands the story, but also um, is sensitive to that story too. So, um, and... For me, I think it's about creating something that is beautiful and luscious, but 
um, what Danny was saying before is like you draw people in and then you hit them hard. <laughs> yeah. And then it's... And then they yeah. will never forget that work ever. And it's um, so, and it, you know, it's, and we've noticed that here for, for Kunaba and Point Pierce as people are drawn to the prints straight away, the images, and they're like, how is that being made? Wow, what about the colour? And then you talk about dried blood, and they're like, oh, okay, yeah. So, but it's, it's creating something that um, is, yeah going to um, remain in someone's mind for a long period of time yeah. and and I think um, it's, yeah, there's this sense of, um, for me it's a yeah, sense of achievement in, in, in doing that, for not just for myself but for the story behind the work too, yeah. Mm. So one thing that I think I'll close with, and we're not going to take any questions, is um, I think that uh, the histories that you're all working with and the particular, you know, futures that you manifest, you kind of slice through it, right? I think of um, often colonial histories are thick like sludge and that creates a sense of amnesia that's the same. It's kind of like the slow slog, right? That's why, Diane, I loved when you said, you know, if you don't know what the Dawes Act is, you better do your homework, right? It's the responsibility of all of us. But I think that, you know, one thing I want to close with is sometimes we get the history we're ready for, but also the way that that's done is through works that kind of slice through, right? That can be searing and even searing in their beauty. So I wanna thank each of, all, each of you for that. And thank you all for being here.